for a retrospective show. For a retrospective show. The for a retrospective show. Scarlet Street, 1945. This was the second combination of Lang, Robinson, Bennett, and Durai. They did the year before The Woman in the Window, similarly themed film noir. I'm a huge fan of Lang in particular. He's one of my favorite filmmakers. This is right up there with a lot of the better film noirs he's made. I think he started making films in Germany, then went to um, France for a while, then ultimately in the U.S., it really seems once he got to the U.S., he kind of settled down into the film noir genre. And most of the films he made at that point were kind of film noirs. But um, he also made some other great ones, the Dr. Magoo's films, Metropolis, M, um, and another really good film noir, The Big Heat, um, as well. Another smaller film that um, isn't as popular, The Fury and Rancho Notorious, two of them um, is more obscure films that I like. And I eventually want to get to um, a, f a few others that I haven't seen, but I've seen most of his more important films. Um, are you a fan of Lang in particular? Because you did choose this film. Uh, honestly, it was just the, I, I read over the synopsis and I was like, oh, that sounds really interesting. But I, I'm not familiar with him at all. So this was the first film of his I've ever seen. What did you think? I loved it. I, I thought it was great. I mean, there was, in my opinion, there weren't really any slow moments or any loose plot points or plot holes. I, I think it was very well written, well acted. It was a pretty tight piece. It, it flowed very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a very tight, um, tightly written, shot, directed, acted film. Uh, it was even to a certain point, a little dense, which I, which I loved as well. Um, that works well with the film noir genre. But I got to tell you, man, this film was so dark and so bleak, which I love. Those are those are some of the reasons why I love film noir and horror to a lesser extent. But when I watch movies like this that are so well acted, it just gets me so depressed watching it. You know, you just start feeling for the characters. And it's, this is it was a tough watch for me, not because I didn't enjoy it, but because it, it just got me so down, like my mood. It just made me so depressed. It's uh, here. I am with a big grin. I don't sound very <laughs> vocal, but <laughs> oh. you do. You just watch this for entertainment value. You don't get caught up in that sort of stuff. Like, how did you feel watching? Well, this? I like. I can. I can see how it, it was kind of very sad. Everyone's situation. How you have Kitty, which she was just head over heels over this Johnny guy. He didn't care about her. He was just kind of stringing her along and just using her. And then there was Chris, who was very much like Kitty. He was in a bad relationship and he liked Kitty and, and she was also just giving him the brush off. So it's kind of a, a lot of the same bad energy going around. Do you even have the I don't remember his name, but the supposed dead husband who shows up and he's like, no, I don't want my wife back. Just pay me and I'll stay out of your way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, it's a lot of despicable characters in this film. Um, I, I, this is th this film kind of confused me a little bit as far as like what these characters were supposed to be, because I've watched this a few times before being a Lang fan and being a film noir fan. Um, but I didn't really read up on it much. I, I, I did that, obviously, for the review. And from what I read, it started to make more sense to me in that this wasn't an original production. It was, I read some places it was based on a novel, other places it was based on a play, but it was based on a previous source material. And it was also made into a film before by Jean Renoir. Um, Jean Renoir is a really great filmmaker that I haven't really gotten into too much. I had a kick where I was watching a lot of foreign films and I kind of stopped right around the time I was going to get to his filmography. But he did um, this uh, an adaptation of this film as well, La Chine, or Chine, um, in 1931. And I think it translate to, translates to the bitch. But basically, uh, it was about a woman and her pimp exploiting a painter. And that made things make a lot more sense to me because the dynamic with uh, the relationship uh, it didn't really make a lot of sense between uh, Kitty and um, Johnny. It's like, I didn't really fully grasp their dynamic. 
but then viewing it in the eyes of, okay, he's supposed to be the pin and, you know, and she's like the, the hooker or whatever yeah. that made the relationship made more sense to me because otherwise contextually, it didn't really make a lot of sense. Like the way he was slapping her around, coming to her for money, all of that made more sense when you knew like what the source material was. Did, did yeah. that change anything for you? Or what did you think about their relationship? Honestly, I just kind of, I saw him as a loser, a low life and Kitty was just this, this total ditz. And even he re refers to her as green. And I'm like, yeah, it's kind of like wising up a little. And she just never really does. She just keeps going along with, with what he says. And I, I like that line where she makes reference to Chris saying like, he's so nice. I mean, like if he would rough me up a little, I'd like him better. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's insane. So, a, a female perspective from this: Have you been in any kind of toxic relationship like this, or know any other like girlfriends that have been in this kind of toxic relationship? And like, what do you think like drives women to stay with guys like this? I I would I would kind of go back to the whole nature nurture thing, like especially if you grew up in a toxic environment like that for girls is especially you imprint on what you see. And there's this theory that women imprint on their fathers. So they, they look for men that, that have that same sort of attitude and energy, which I know it's, it's not, a, not really a very good thing to say, but I, I can see to a degree how, how it does happen. Like I did have friends growing up that they wound up in bad situations and it's, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's believable in that sense, especially understanding maybe that bit of information to it. But I, I think, especially in Chris's case, men men also fall prey to it where maybe men find women that aren't the best for them and they're, they're very mean and abusive. Chris's wife and Kitty were just horrible to him. They they kind of would talk down to him. He was very underappreciated. No one ever really praised him or, or said, hey, you know, you're really smart or you're really kind or that was very thoughtful of you or, hey, you know what? Th that's a really nice painting. Nothing. It's just kind of like, get me a radio that works. I don't want this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 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 job. Yeah, it, it's kind of interesting because like I, I don't obviously I don't have that type of perspective. That's why I'm asking you. Maybe you had a different perspective on, on, on things like that. But the way I view it is just like you have these um, these men that are simps like Chris mm. who feel like if they just do everything and they're just overly nice and they just fawn after women and just like overtly praise them and just do anything they want that they'll get their affection. And mm. that isn't always the case. And usually it's never the case because you, you you're then not respected. Um, but then you have the other extreme of the guys who just like, I guess they maybe they bring a certain level of excitement in, mm -hmm. in, in, with the danger and the the um, volatility of, of their personality or, um, like you said, maybe daddy issues. So it's just kind of interesting to see the two opposite parallels uh, of, of, you know, those of, of, of archetypes. Of, mm -hmm. of men going after the same women. So I just found that interesting. Um, it, it, and yeah, uh, Chris, Chris is, yeah, man. I, it, it, the, th the interesting thing about Chris is that um, he's similar to a lot of the characters, main characters you'll see in Lang films. I know you, you said you aren't as familiar with them, mm -hmm. but a lot of the main characters in Lang films are terrible people who do terrible things but he gives you a perspective that makes you sympathize with them. And you almost end up rooting for them, despite the fact that this guy's a murderer at the end of the day. It's like, you 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 root, you want him to get away with it, or at least I did. It's like, man, like these two are like horrible people. They deserve to die, you know? You know, Johnny deserves to go to the chair even though he didn't kill her because he was so shitty to her. And she was so shitty, Kitty was so shitty to, to um to Chris is like she deserved like what she got. They they yeah. were so unrepentant and like casually like callous and like oh my god they were like two of the worst characters like I've ever seen on film. Yeah, that I I actually kind of liked that that 
it's everybody sort of got their their come up and so nobody really got away with anything and even poor Chris, he kind of goes mad at the end and he becomes homeless. And it's even he just kind of got a little taste of what was going around, unfortunately. Yeah, I will say that the that sequence I didn't like at all. I thought it was a very tight production, a very dense production. But once um, Johnny got the chair, I, the movie just it started going in slow motion. I didn't like any of that stuff afterwards. I know it's a time... And he, I think this movie was banned in like several cities, New York, Atlanta, a few other cities um, at the time because it was, I think Milwaukee um, was another one because it was so dark and so bleak and the criminals didn't, the criminal kind of didn't really get punished at the end because he got away with it. And with the Hayes Code, that wasn't the thing you did. Uh, not until like later on, maybe in the 60s when things got a little bit more relaxed. But that tacked on ending one, it felt tacked on, and two, this fast-paced film just suddenly started like completely slowing down. It lost all nuance to it, and I just really didn't like, I wouldn't say the third act, but there's like the final like 15, 10, 15 minutes of the film just didn't do it for me at all. Yeah, it kind of felt like maybe a little bit sloppy or a little bit forced, kind of like, you know, all these bad people are getting what they deserve, and I, I was thinking the same thing, like the Hayes Code, like, was this purposely done to where kind of everybody had to pay for what they did since pre-code every, like, there weren't really things like that where the bad guy couldn't just get away with with murder or or whatever. And then he gets kicked out of his home, he loses his job, then he's homeless, and then he's just some nut job. And it's kind of like, I kind of wanted Chris to be okay, especially after everything he he put up with. <laughs> yeah, even though he's a murderer, like you, like I said, that's the thing with the line. He makes you root for like the bad guy in a way because he gives the bad guy this like terrible origin story in a way. I guess you could say. Um, but yeah, like you, you want him to get away with it, um, and uh, like I said, it just it just lacked the nuance that the rest of the film had, um, and it, it just didn't really do it for me. Uh, what did you think of the performance of the of the main cast? What did you think of Joan Bennett, who played Kitty? I think she was really good. It's just that was the only issue I had with her character. And she was just very, very girl-like, very childish. Even her name is just implies that she's still just a kid, kind of not really wise to a lot of things. And they don't really explain why. I mean, obviously, she wants to be an actress and all this thing. So you, it's funny because usually people who are actors or want to become actors by trade they they have to pick up observation and she she wasn't very quick to the catch on anything yeah yeah like i said i mean knowing that her character was intended to be like a call girl or a hooker or a prostitute whatever has that context makes it make more sense dan durai or durai i always i always get his last name pronunciation wrong it might be duri but he's the guy that played johnny prince i thought he was pretty good he generally plays bad guys in a lot of films but i, I think this is him at his peak he's just like despicable and sleazy and unrepentant and just the way he talks to her like i said knowing that he's a pimp in the original context of the story has it make more sense because um, she was like, hey, I hate him when he touches me. He tried to kiss me. He's like, hey, don't act like you haven't been kissed before. It's like, you know, stuff like that. He would tell her. Yeah. It was just so despicable. But I think he plays despicable as well as any actor I've seen on screen. I I, I agree. I, I loved to hate him. And especially the fact that other characters in the film just like he rubbed everyone the wrong way. And I see, I didn't know about the whole pimp and prostitute thing but the early line where she first meets Chris where Kitty's first talking to Chris in the diner and she says it's 10 o'clock I just got off of work and he's like well what are you doing she's like take a guess and my first thought was oh and and he's like well you're an actress she's like good guess <laughs> <laughs> and uh Edward G Robinson uh have you seen him in any other thing except for this have you I'm Pretty much the, I'm I'm more like golden age Hollywood when it comes to classic actors. So anything that anybody who was not in basically a Hitchcock film or like one of the bigger known pictures, I, I really don't know who, who anyone is. So I'm kind of getting a crash course as, as we go through these. Okay. Yeah. I would say Hitchcock is more the latter end of the golden age. 
Um, he he made his name basically playing gangsters, like Little Caesar. He was the guy that if you hear like people mocking old time gangster, hey, look, she, yeah, this is what we're gonna do, she. He's the one that he's the one that talked like that in Little Caesar, uh, one of the first like big Warner Brother gangster films. And he used, he got a lot of parts like that early in his career. He was like a really big time star. But as he aged out, obviously he was short, wasn't attractive, and he started getting more supporting type roles. What I found interesting is that he didn't like this one or Woman in the Window. He found shooting both of them monotonous and he didn't like playing either of the characters. I've seen both films. I thought he was great in both films. And I read up in Lang, and Lang was a big fan of Edward G. Robinson, but Robinson himself didn't enjoy this or Woman in the Window, and he just couldn't wait to get both projects over with because hmm. he saw the similarities in them and just didn't find either like that interesting. But I thought he was maybe the best performance in the whole film. So it sounds more like it was kind of like a contractual issue, like you sign on for X amount of pictures and... They're basically, to my understanding, back in the day, they were assigned. You didn't really get to pick what you wanted to play. I definitely know that was throughout the 30s. I'm not sure if that was if they were still under contract in by 1945. Um, mm -hmm. It could be the case. Uh, but at this point in his career, whether he was under contract or not, he was in his early 50s. And again, he doesn't have... I mean, he has good screen presence, but he's not going to be getting lead roles at 52. So a big role like this, I'm sure he, you know, he'll take whatever he can get. I mean, he was starring in, I think Soylent Green was the last film he starred in. So he was starring oh. in a lot of campy, like B-movie stuff uh, by the end of his career. So, um, yeah, whether it's contracts or money, I mean, this, this was a good role for him, whether he liked it or not. I thought he was great. I think that's, that's more the case for most films, even nowadays, modern actors, they kind of, you either fade out and, and you go into low budget films or independent films and it's the the pickings are a lot more slim. So it's kind of like, well, do you want to work or do you want to be picky? <laughs> exactly. Like, do you want to pay for that boat or not? You know, uh, the only other thing that I had had written down was kind of like where Chris is talking about painting and I, I really liked the comparison and, and maybe it kind of falls into like the whole prostitute motif that Chris refers to his paintings as a love affair where you have to really be in it. And, you know, it's kind of like you're in love with that painting the moment that you're working on it. It can take either a, a month or a year, but you have to really be committed to it. And it's kind of, I like how Kitty ripped that off, but she wasn't really committed to this job that she was trying to pull. <laughs> But yeah, I don't know what that's. I, I mean, that, that I made me hate her even more too when she just like basically just like used his words verbatim and she gets credit for it and you know he gets nothing. Um, I, I I do have a theory on this. I want to save it for the end after you, you mentioned that you aren't familiar with Lang films. Um, but Lang was a very hated person. Um, he did this film. I don't know if you you probably never saw it, but you maybe you heard of Metropolis, and it's very like gothic looking. And like, basically it's Tim Burton, every mm -hmm. Tim Burton movie basically borrows from Metropolis. It's like that it has that type of look to it. And it was this very early thirties silent film, uh, historic yeah, I, film. I think I've, I think I've seen that one kind of like where it's a commentary piece on socialism or I believe that's what they were commentating on. Yeah. And there was like a robotic woman and they're a bunch mm -hmm. of people working in a factory and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so, um, he had a woman in a metal suit and even like in between takes, he wouldn't let her get out of it. And she oh. would just be like sweating and about to pass out. And he would do stuff like that to a lot of actors. Actors hated him. Producers hated him. No one wanted to work with him. He was, and that cost him a lot during like towards the latter end of his career. Like when you're not as popular, like we were talking with Edward G. Robinson, when you're not in your prime and people don't want to put up with your shit anymore. Like yeah. that kind of hurt him towards the end of his career. Um, but he was notorious, a hated tyrant. And I think that that permeates throughout his films because in all of his films, they have characters like this, like Chris, where it's just like, um, they're viewed at, you could, they're kind of like, they're bad guys, 
but he's trying to explain to you like, no, like they're really good if you look at them in this kind of a way, you know, it's like, don't look at it that way. Like, like he's really a good guy, you know? I just kind of think like, he, he the, I also read a quote where he says he kind of keeps his personal life and his film separate, but I, just being a filmmaker myself, I know it's hard to divide those two things. And I, I just think like he kind of views himself in these films where he kind of justifies like bad behavior. So like, even though like in, in this where Chris kills a woman, it's like justifying like why it's a good idea that he killed him. And uh, with Fury and a lot of his other films, they kind of have that same motif where the lead character does this terrible thing, but either before or after they do it, there's this like backstory or explanation of like why he's justified to do it and why you should still love this person. So. Um, I just, that's my own personal theory I wanted to throw out there, but I, I watch too many movies. So maybe this could just all be made up in my head. So, no, uh, I, I actually see a lot of that in Johnny, and I, I agree with it kind of like, well, you know, this is, uh, at least in, in regards to Johnny, kind of like, this is owed to me, like, that's my money, that's my jewelry, like, very self justifying. And I, just to digress slightly, it reminds me of an Asian director, Kim Ki Duck. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he plays with those motifs a lot too. Kind of like he likes to flip things to where he'll uh, take a theme of, say, prostitution and, and, um, he kind of justifies it by saying the girl who's prostituting herself is actually paying back a bunch of men that she ripped off like several years ago. And it's kind of, he does little weird twists like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I find all that stuff interesting. It's like to take conventional stuff or take something you would look at one way and make you look at it in another way. Um, mm -hmm. I, I find stuff like that very interesting. Um, and I love dark and bleak films, even though they make me, immensely depressed watching it like i was like 20 minutes into this i was like why did she pick this movie and make me watch this <laughs> i'm so depressed right now it's like you feel so much for chris it's like you want it's like you know it's not going to turn out well for him but you're rooting for him so much it's like god she hates you how can you not see that she doesn't like you you know but i think like it for me, maybe it makes me think of like mistakes I've made or it's just like, man, like why didn't I see that thing in my past coming? Maybe it's part of that or maybe just getting like, you know, caught up in the film itself. But I, I just love stories like this. And uh, I, I think this is definitely one of the top notch film noirs. But I will say I wouldn't watch the last 10 minutes. I'd say watch the movie and once uh, once Johnny gets the electric chair to shut it off, those those last few minutes aren't, aren't worth it in my opinion. I, I would agree. It doesn't really add anything to the movie and it, it does. It just kind of makes it feel a little bit kind of slapped together or, or sloppy. Yeah. Like it's a moral tale. It's like, this wasn't a moral tale. This was like, you know, just like a depressing film noir, you know, they try to teach me lessons about getting away with crimes and stuff like that at the end.